Hello, welcome to the premiere episode of Horace Rising. I'm Alan Peoples, joined by Patricia Lehman and Jocelyn Starfeather today. Hello, Patricia. Hey, Alan, great to see you. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi, Alan, wonderful to be here with you both. Thanks, Patricia. Would you like to tell our audience a bit about what we're doing? Yeah, um, this is, as Alan said, the beginning of a full series of lecture presentations along with some discussion um, about everything ancient Egypt. Um, it's titled Ancient Egypt Mysticism or Egyptian Mysticism. However, um, we're going to touch on so many different things. I have several series in mind, um, but we're going to start out, I like to say with the basics, but it's not going to seem very basic. There's some really deep things we're going to get into in the presentations. Uh, today, we're going to start out with information about uh, how we perceive reality. Um, and then we're going to start going deeper into uh, what the pantheon of gods and goddesses actually is. We're going to talk about the netters, we're going to, which is what they were, <laughs> uh, forces of nature. Uh, we're going to talk about the stars, astrology, um, the mythologies, so many different aspects. We will get into megalithic. Uh, aspects of ancient Egypt uh, and the pyramids and who built them. We're going to talk uh, about uh, the resurrection rituals. We're going to talk about um, many of the different ancient rituals that they used and why they used them and what they represent. We will talk about, um, wow, so many different things. We're going to do things uh, about the Ark of the Covenant, about Atlantis, um, the Egyptian uh, concept of what Atlantis was. Uh, the catastrophism uh, that everybody speaks about. Um, and more importantly, the basic foundational knowing, which was that uh, we perceive reality in cycles of conscious perception. And this is, this is why I want to start with perception, because when we will understand more of what the ancients really understood, we try and understand everything that we look at from a current um, perception of reality, a, a current perception of time and space. But what if, you know, we don't always perceive time and space the same way? And so I want to introduce some concepts and ideas to open your minds to, you know, how, you know, so many of the ancient civilizations talk about uh, the fact that time is an illusion, you know, and that, uh, you know, it just, so many different things that we can't wrap our heads around because we we experience life as a here and now. But what if there's only now? And what if everything we're experiencing is just a movie? So these are the concepts I'm going to introduce and hopefully explain in such a way that you can wrap your heads around it and understand. And then we can go even deeper because what the ancients knew was just beyond, I think, what you know, what we can even conceive of in many ways, but this opens doors to a new way of looking things so that we can get even closer. So yeah, it's exciting. And a big part of this is recognizing fractal patterns that continue throughout our reality. Yeah, you're absolutely right, um, Alan. Uh, it's all, and, and and we're going to get into this right in the beginning, but everything that's introduced, symbolism and mythology, is introducing these concepts about the fractal patterns, the formulaic patterns that are the foundation of everything we experience. Um, and I, I honestly believe that this is what the ancients were presenting to us for many different reasons. Um, and I think we should just get started because we can talk about, you know, and, and for those that don't know me, I guess it's really important to just do a brief introduction about myself, but um, I, I am Patricia Aoyan Lehman. I came to Egypt. I live in Egypt. I've been here for uh, almost 14 years now, uh, which is just <laughs> beyond belief. But um, I came here because Egypt has always been in my blood. I've known since I was a child that uh, there was something about Egypt, that uh, in a way Egypt was my home. And uh, I knew I would eventually come here. And um, since I've been here, it has been, you know, 
my whole focus is on trying to understand, you know, what everything here, the structures, the symbolism, the, the mythology, what it all means. Um, and I'm still here because it's so incredibly profound and I'm still unraveling clues. So, you know, it, it's just so exciting. Um, I came here to meet the first time. What, what brought me to Egypt for the very first time was coming on a tour to meet Abdel Hakim Awian. And um, I will talk about him throughout the series uh, because he, you know, I've been studying esoteric sciences, physical science, all sciences, astrology, you name it, since I was a child. I was so lucky to have been brought up in a family that, you know, almost nurtured open-mindedness. And I was not... Um, prevented from exploring all these, you know, concepts uh, about, you know, alternative thoughts and studies and ideas, metaphysical, esoteric. Um, and so when I came to Egypt and met Abdel Hakim, he, I, everything he spoke about resonated with me. So when I get started, I'm going to introduce him. Um, and he unfortunately passed away the year that I came. But uh, my, 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 my initial you know, journey here into the research and the study and the experiencing of Egypt was built on a foundational knowing that he had. And I wanted to take much of what he had said and had never explained and totally figure out why he said it. And that was such a fantastic journey to actually fully understand to the point that today I walk and I see these things and I experience these things and unravel the clues and I think, oh my God, he must have known all of this to have said that. Um, and uh, in a way, that's probably one of the most exciting things about this journey is, you know, these, these wise elders all over the world give us these tidbits of amazing knowledge, but we don't often get to understand how they got there. And for me, well, like you said, they, they, they speak to you at your level, at your current level of yes, understanding. Exactly. It's sort of like when you read a book. The first time you're like, oh, wow, that's really great. And then you read it again, maybe a year or two later, and it, it, it tells you incredibly new information. You know, every time you read a book, something new jumps off the pages because you're at a different stage. So, and, and that's sort of what happens with the temples as well. You know, I remember the first time I walked through and went, oh my gosh, I, I thought it was, you know, everything was just speaking to me. I didn't have a clue. It was barely the beginning of the, the story. It was the prologue. I had no clue how much more information was going to be dancing off those walls and structures. So, yeah. And as I said, it's an ongoing journey. <laughs> the mystery is so deep there. I know I've been to... Egypt now, I've been had the joy of being on three different tours with you now, Patricia, and um, I feel like every time I go, I think I know certain things, and then I come back and realize, wow, after that, I know even less, <laughs> because <laughs> how deep the military is, and how <laughs> profound the levels of, of what is written on the walls there and encoded in the temples, it's just incredible. It's Exactly, it's layers of meaning inside. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, that's exactly what I was going to say, Alan. Um, several, many, many different, I say seven different levels of understanding for everything we experience here related to your chakras in a way, but the seven, the seven is such an essential number of creation. And we'll talk a lot of, about that, but that understanding that, yes, we might walk in and get a root chakra understanding, or we've been told a root chakra understanding of what everything means. And that's even our religions and everything across the board. But when you start going deeper and moving, you know, just opening your senses. And this is what Hakim said, as you open your senses, and he said we had 360, right? As you open all these extra senses, you begin to see things totally differently. And that's what I've experienced here. It's like, I thought I knew what the story meant. Oh my gosh. It has so many layers and upon layers. And you know, how do we get from here to here? Well, you just keep you just keep at it and you keep asking questions. The most important thing that we can do as human beings, because this reality is an interactive process. 
And if you ask questions, you will get answers. It's those of us that are lazy and just sit around and wait for information or life to happen to us and we wonder why nothing happens and it, it can't. It doesn't work that way. So yeah. It's all it's, about frequency. You're right on the money. Yep. About consciously modulating your own frequency to meet that information and that understanding will naturally unfold. Exactly. Exactly. And that's where the questions come from. You know, as you're pondering it, you know, I always say the minute I discover something and I'm so blown away, it's it, it brings like 10 more questions. You know, you, every question brings 10 more if you get even close to the answer. So that's the journey that I think that's the hero's journey. And that's something else I'm going to talk about a lot because I, that's where we're at right now. All of us, they say hero, heroine, whatever you want to call it. We're on that journey of discovery. And, well, that's uh, it. The hero's journey is the overarching fractal pattern of all of humanity and our great year cycle as the yep. sun moves through the ecliptic, yep. the signs every of the zodiac. Cycle. This is the hero's yep. journey and it mirrors every stage of all of our lives. We all experience these exact same fractal patterns at some point. Like even today, before we started this first episode, I was thinking this is the exact same fractal pattern as a bird being pushed out of a nest to learn to fly for the first time as we <laughs> launch our podcast. <laughs> How beautiful. I like that. Great metaphor. Cool. So should we get started and then we can just keep... Uh, by the way, the um, website attached to uh, everything we're presenting is HorraceRising.com. And uh, we have, I have a Facebook page as well uh, that is Horace Rising uh, for people to come and interact and even ask questions. If you see some of these episodes and you have questions, um, please feel free uh, and to contact me as well. So we were talking about Abdel Hakim um, and some of you might recognize him. Uh, in uh, there was a series done by Carmen Bolter called The Pyramid Code, and he was featured in that series. Um, and uh, just an incredible man. Uh, they used to call him the Keeper of the Keys, uh, which I like. It, it to me, it's even a better better term than uh, or phrase than the Wisdom Keeper. He was the Keeper of the Keys. If anybody, you know, anybody who came into Naslet Saman, the village at the foot of the pyramids and wanted to know, you know, at, wanted to find the, the person who knew, they were always directed to uh, Hakim. He was, he was the keeper of the keys um, and could answer the questions. Um, but what a lot of people don't know about him is he had degrees in both archeology span and Egyptology um, at Baud University, which is now today Cairo University. Um, and he also did graduate work at Leiden University in Holland. Uh, he spent more than 50 years working as a tour guide and, you know, all, <laughs> all of the most famous uh, tour hosts back then for alternative spiritual tours used to come and use Hakim, people like Greg Braden and David Icke and you know, you, it's so many different people uh, came and worked with Hakim. And uh, it, it, to me, it's just incredible. And everybody has wonderful stories to tell. Uh, Barbara Han Clow was another one that worked with Hakim uh, really closely. And uh, there's a great story I can tell about the Grateful Dead coming to me, <laughs> Hakim, <laughs> when they came to play at the foot of the, the, the pyramids. Did you want to say something, Alan? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I can't see anybody. <laughs> now, so, <laughs> okay. Um, and he had more than 65 years of field experience, uh, which is just absolutely incredible. And, and it, you know, that tells a story in and of itself. He used to tell so many stories. He grew up on the plateau. He grew up in that small village when there were no fences around the Giza plateau. Um, there was, you know, it was his playground basically. Uh, his father died when he was quite young, and his uncle was a local antiquities dealer <laughs> when it was still legal back then. And he used to send all the kids, uh, including Hakim, up to the plateau to look for antiquities. But uh, Hakim used to say he'd go up and he'd kick around some sand, and then he'd get lost in the temples and in the structures and just... 
he became totally enthralled with what he was seeing and experiencing, and he put himself through school um, because he needed to know more. Um, and, uh, you know, this is how it, it all began for him. Um, and he was so incredible. He was an expert etymologist. And I remember sitting with him because I did, you know, I came to Egypt. Um, he was lecturing at the tour. And that's what brought me here. And we spent a lot of time at his house and sitting and talking. And then um, the tour host, who was Stephen Mailer, when I went, and this was in 2005, asked us, what would we do differently, you know, on the tour? And the tour was just spectacular. I cannot tell you. I was just blown away. But uh, I, I remember telling him, you know, well, let's, let's do a little less shopping, spend more time at the sites. And, hmm, could we get Hakeem to come out of retirement and join the tour? And uh, the, the funny thing is they did. A year and a half later, I was uh, collecting my pennies again and coming back to Egypt because they did bring Hakim on the full tour. And it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life to see this man who so loved Egypt and had not been to the sites in so long. And as he, he came to some of his special places, you could see the tears in his eyes. And even more amazing was the, the, the local, the key, we call them the keepers at the sites. The, um, we see the gentlemen in the, wearing the long galabeas. Uh, and they, in many times, especially back then, they move around more now. But these, these keepers used to be like generations of one family would be the keepers of a specific site. And so they gained so much knowledge. And um, they would come running from where they were when they heard that Hakim was there and they come with tears in their eyes and they grab a chair for him and they bring shisha and they'd sit and they'd smoke, make tea for him. And it was just truly, you know, it, it's just amazing to see how deeply he was loved. Um, and that's another thing about his ability. He, um, he, his, he was an expert in languages, as I said, and he spoke, uh, fluently eight languages, and uh, he knew several more, um, enough to be dangerous anyway. Um, but he knew just about every dialect in Egypt of Egyptian Arabic. And in, uh, as with any other many other countries, as you move between districts, the, the language changes a bit. But Hakim knew all of the, the dialects and all, you know, all the different aspects. And he would go to all these places, obviously, uh, doing field work and or on tours. And he would sit with, with the locals. And his, his uh, dialect was so perfect that they actually wondered what part of the village he grew up in. Uh, and because these people, you know, these, these were the people that, you know, oftentimes, you know, the elders would come out and the people that really, you know, had the indigenous knowledge. And this is how he grew the knowledge, not only through years of research and reading and experience at the sites, but he had the love of the local wisdom keepers. And so, you know, that sharing of knowledge. And even when I sat with him in front of the Aoyan house, he, he had invited me to stay once after another, another trip the next year that I went back to Egypt. Um, and uh, he invited me to stay longer. So I stayed like an extra 10 days, stayed at a bed and breakfast in the village. And we would sit every morning uh, and uh, talk. Sometimes we wouldn't talk. We would we would start talking and then we'd be silent and the conversation would continue and then we'd pick up where we left off, which was absolutely incredible. Hmm. But um, that's how that was how amazing he was. He was so you know he he learned a lot from books, as I said, but he he also utilized his intuition and his you know the, the you know. The other senses, as I said, as he said, open your senses. And this is what he did. And um, as I'm going to tell you in a minute, he told me the hardest thing he ever had to do was unlearn everything he had learned at the university because it didn't answer or address what it was he saw or experienced at the sites. And this is really huge that so many of us take everything at face value. And he didn't do that. If, if his gut told him this, that didn't work for him, then he explored further. And I think this is how he developed this incredible foundation of knowing and, and knowledge and wisdom. Um, and he changed the face of, of Egyptology even because 
the things that he he basically discovered are now well known, um, you know, throughout academia as well as alternative circles. Um, so just really incredible. Um, yeah, this is, it's so amazing to me, Patricia. Every time I, I hear you speak about him, and I've read Stephen Mailer's book, a couple of Stephen Mailer's books now too, and I have that perspective because he was so close to Hakim and. It's just, it's just so amazing that he had this such a deep intellectual knowledge and studies and archaeology and Egyptology, and yet he went so far beyond all of that in what in the wisdom that he carried. Just incredible. Exactly, exactly. It's what set him apart. Um, he 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 was just so amazing to me. Um, and you know, he, the funny thing about him, and you know, I can't say the same for myself. He was a true master. And he, he didn't just run around sharing everything he knew. He waited, he, he waited for people to come and ask. Um, and he would sit and have coffee and just talk about, you know, talk about the weather or, you know, <laughs> what's happening in the world. He would wait for you to say, hey, can you tell me more about this? Um, and that's what a true master does. You have, like I said almost earlier, you have to ask the questions. And then, uh, and the other thing I noticed as I sat with him, um, and I've said this before in other interviews, but it really was amazing for me because people would come. I remember sitting there and Andrew Collins came and a, and a magazine publisher came from Italy and all these different people would come. And oftentimes they'd ask the same question and he didn't give them all the same answer. He spoke to them at the level of their understanding. And, you know, it truly is a master who can do that, that he's not showing off. Well, I, you know, give them, give them the deepest stuff, whether they get it or not. He gave them what they needed to spur them on in their own, you know, journey and, or adventure uh, into the knowledge. And, and I, I thought that was incredibly remarkable. And so <laughs> he... He did, he did say quite often uh, throughout the time that I knew him that if it had to be written, it probably isn't true. Um, and he, he, I remember him telling me that the time for books was over. Um, and I find for myself, you know, I, when, when everything started, the, the, all the events of the last two years started, I, I thought, well, this is a great time. Everybody's in isolation. Why don't I sit down and write that book, you know, that everybody's been asking about? And I, I wrote and I wrote and pages and pages. I can't tell you how many. And I thought, oh, it's going to be three volumes. But in, in the end, I realized that the information, it's not linear. And I was trying to squeeze it into a linear format. And it, it doesn't work because I wanted to bring in every aspect of everything I was talking about. And then uh, the information starts to go in circles. And it, 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 it was just amazing. And it, it reminded me of when he told me this. It's, it's almost impossible today. And the other part of that is what you write down then lives in the book. And, it, you know, we're, nothing is, it, this is hard to explain, but nothing that we actually would say is fact today, it, it could actually change tomorrow or be different in the past um, that everything we experience can literally change through our own expectations we can change our past people say that all the time and it's basically you know even with just our attitude but in many different ways we can change the past in the present <laughs> if that makes sense again if time isn't linear then it's, it's constantly cycling. He said nothing, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. He said it all the time. And, you know, I've heard that in, in many places. And it, you think, well, that's not true because, you know, anything you conceive of has already existed. Well, I can conceive of some pretty crazy things. But um, the funny thing is, if, if it's all about consciousness, <laughs> then, you know, anything is possible. We can create anything if we remember how powerful we are. Um, so yeah, um, and as, as I did say, he said, you know, he basically did have to unlearn almost everything he learned at university because it, it didn't address, you know, and that's another thing I think we all ought to talk about is that, you know, how, 
how this need to write things down actually keeps us in boxes of learning, of understanding. Uh, because when I, we look at ancient Egypt, everything, you know, everybody wants me, to, you know, when I'm presenting my information, everybody wants me to cite books. And I, I oftentimes have to say, well, I can't cite a book because it's, it's, it's something I, you know, I'm not saying it's fact, but I'm offering you ideas in an open box sort of way. And, you know, citing books is not always the answer. Because a lot of the information in Egyptology came from the, you know, the early, the 1800s, early 1900s, when we didn't have the tools and the understanding of certain sciences, of physics, of, of uh, geology. Um, we, we made so many mistakes back then. And if we just rely on citing that material, we are really um, being irresponsible and not you know, it, it, it's just not a good way to grow the knowledge. I well, think it's a little like to... using 200 year old medical texts to try to perform open heart surgery today or, you know, something similar. Exactly. The knowledge yeah. has evolved so much since then. Oh yeah, exactly. You know, like they're doing, as you say, heart transplants and things like that, that we didn't have the ability to do a hundred years ago. And if, you know, it's just we, we tend to limit ourselves. Uh, and again, that's all about the state of consciousness that we're in. We, you know, we label everything, we put everything in boxes, tie a string around it and say, that's what it is. And we well, feel it's a matter of perspective. Way. We're looking at it exactly. only one way, only from one direction rather than examining it from all ways. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. So I included, this is one little video I included um, because I think it sort of explains this in such a beautiful way. What is science? People talk glibly about science. What is science? People coming out of a university with a master's degree or a PhD, you take them into the field and they, they literally don't believe anything that this is a peer review project. It's the only thing they accept. And you say to them, but let's observe, let's think, let's discuss, they don't do it. It's just, is it in a paper, peer review paper or not? That's their view of science. I think it's pathetic. Going into universities as bright young people, they come out of them brain dead, not even knowing what science means. They think it means peer reviewed papers, etc. No, that's academia. And if a paper is peer reviewed, it means everybody thought the same, therefore they approved it. An unintended consequence is that when new knowledge emerges, new scientific insights, they can never ever be peer reviewed. So we're blocking all new advances in science that are big advances. If you look at the breakthroughs in science, almost always they don't come from the center of that profession. They come from the fringe. The finest candle makers in the world couldn't even think of electric lights. They don't come from within. They often come from outside the breaks. We're going to kill ourselves because of stupidity. Yikes. <laughs> I do want to give Robert Schock the credit for this video I saw he, he actually posted this on social media and when I saw it I thought wow that's that's such a great explanation of where we're at with you know all of all of, all of the different fields of science today Oops. <laughs> so what if they were and I'm saying they being the ancient Egyptians or Kamishans as we like to call them based on uh, Egypt being uh, Kemet, uh, what if they were much more aware and advanced than we are? Uh, and I believe they act, uh, they absolutely were. Um, and they, you know, just from the differences to who they were to where we're at, they had a deep, deep connection to nature. Um, and, in, and, and, and because they did, I mean, they understood nature in ways that, you know, we don't take the time 
you know, when they when they would study like, you know, and we know this from how they presented this information within their symbolism and mythology, but when they would study like an animal, like a cow or like, you know, any any animal, a jackal, they understood every little aspect of it. You know, we study the cow, but we don't know how the digestion works, you know, unless that's our field of, of you know, uh, our, of choice. Um, and they did. They understood everything about nature. Um, and because of this, they used implosive technologies uh, instead of explosive technology. And when I mean when I say that, I mean they they harness the forces of nature, the power, the force of the currency of water, uh, the atmosphere, the life force in the atmosphere. Uh, the sun, the you know, ev the different qualities of energy in the different minerals, um, and even the and the currents, the earth currents, all of these things they knew how to harness uh, to create, you know, erect and create beautiful, incredible feats that you know we find sometimes not always, but sometimes impossible today. But when we try to replicate what they did. We tend to use explosive technologies, meaning technologies that actually harm the environment. Um, and uh, you can even look at, you know, what we do with our food and our food additives, and you know how, you know, our 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 energies are mostly synthetic, and as I said, work against nature. And everything's they out of balance with nature. Hallelujah! Everything's out of my eye. Yep, exactly. Um, and they had an incredible knowledge, and, and people don't realize this because we're led to believe that they were prehistoric and cavemen and, you know, didn't know much or whatever. We, you know, we're, we're given this thought, but the truth is they had an absolutely incredible knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, astrology, geology, physics, you, you name it. Um, and they understood it in a way that everything was connected, um, and we tend to... When we study these different fields, we we go we we take them into the little tiny aspects of every field. You know, it's like astro by by you know physics physics or you know it, it, we just we just take it into tiny little uh, different aspects, and we can't see the whole where everything is actually connected. If you understand physics, you understand biology, you understand astronomy because they all work and by the same principles, and that is alchemy. Um, and, and an alchemical understanding. And you have to point out that to the uh, ancient Egyptians, their science and their religion were one and the same. This was the same subject to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. That all of these sciences, yes, they were all mirrors of each other and mirrors of the spiritual self. As And as, like you said, Alan, as above, above so below, everything was a mirror of everything else in fractal patterns. Right. So, Their yeah. entire society was built around the fractal pattern of the human body as it equates to the entire universe. Exactly. Yep. So all you had to do was plug yourself into it and you experience <laughs> <laughs> everything to the fullest. Exactly. And once you understand any one pattern, you understand them all. And, and, and that's what's absolutely amazing. Um, and, and the foundational pattern, by the way, and I'll talk about this a lot, is just the breath, the breath of life. You know, the intake and the outtake of the breath is that foundational sine wave pattern. But let's keep going. Um, oh, and the architect, oh, enhanced agricultural practices. This is mm. huge. They were able to, I mean, amazing, you know, they, they fed thousands, of, if not millions of people for thousands of years which is really unheard of. Most civilizations looking back only last about 200, a couple hundred years, where the Egyptian civilization lasted thousands of years. Um, and the Nile and their agriculture sustained them because they understood how to, again, harness those forces of nature. And we'll talk about that. And, um, and of course, they built incredible architectural wonders. So yeah, these people were not paid well, they might have lived in caves, <laughs> but they were not, they were not intellectually inept. Um, I believe, you know, and, and Alan sort of pointed this out, they harnessed even, you know, the two hemispheres of their brain, they were able to utilize and function as higher, uh, higher beings. 
the, at one time, not necessarily throughout the entire thousands of years. We're going to talk about consciousness evolving and devolving. Um, yeah, Patricia, that was one thing I was going to pop in and say, and I'm sure you will cover this in depth, but it's just fascinating that the farther we go back, the more advanced everything is, the more refined, the higher quality, higher consciousness as we go back in time with Egypt. Yes. So, Yes, you're right. Uh, it's a great way to even date and relate different items at the sites because when you see the really fine, incredible craftsmanship, you know it's much more ancient than, you know, yeah. The chicken scratch that comes later, or you know, <laughs> I don't like the color. Right. That, but. Well, the old kingdom art is uh, much more sophisticated than the most recent. Oh, and absolutely! It's and exquisite. just imagine what they were doing before that, <laughs> before the exactly, old, before exactly. the old, and before right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, no, no. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> but also they were able to um, take something like a statue and embody it with life force. Um, and that's something we don't even have the ability to do today, but they knew how to fashion something, finely craft it so that it was basically embodying an archetypal energy. It, you know, it, it, it's, it's like say it's alive. Their temples were alive because they harness the currency underneath them. They chose the place, you know, was the most important thing. Um, and, you know, it's just incredible to think that, you know, we, we once had this capability. And I like to say we're the ones that built, you know, the pyramids and the temples um, at a different time to, as some, in, in my opinion, as halls of records to pre prepare us for what's going on, I think, in this very now moment. But yeah and not just in egypt we see this uh exact same phenomenon all over the world oh absolutely yeah definitely. Gobekli Tepe. i know i've been thinking about that a lot lately um i hope the the three of us can get there this year hmm. um, again <laughs> so so why symbolism in mythology um you know the way i see you know a lot of people would like would like to believe that it's just storytelling and legends and we don't have to put any truth or fact in the mythologies. But uh, the more I've researched, traveled the world, studied, uh, I, 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 I can see that the, the mythologies are so similar all over the world. You know, the names, the dates, you know, the, the situations might change a little bit. But the stories are telling the same thing. There's a, a basic formula to the stories, uh, even in our religious dogma. Uh, and oftentimes they're related to the stars, but the stars, of course, as above, so below, are related to us. And they're telling the story of us, of our creation, of who we are. Um, and so, you know, and the symbolism is beyond amazing. And, you know, oftentimes we see the same symbols all over the world, or they're just, again, changed just a little bit. Um, and uh, language is another, you know, language is symbolism. And, you know, your basic tones are often used the same all over the world, even with different languages, you know, ba, ka. Uh, Ra, these these things often mean the same things in different parts. Ma, of the world. ha, exactly. Almost um, every language, mother yeah, and father language is virtually identical. Exactly, and that's something we're going to talk a lot about too: is language and the symbolism within language. It's it's really incredible. Um, but yeah, so when you we begin to realize that they weren't just telling stories for entertainment, that they were really providing us an amazing amount of information. And basically metaphors, you know, I, you know, for cosmic and physical creation with the creation stories all over the world. And they're all so similar. Um, historic references, of course, physics, alchemy, astronomy, biology. Um, and yes, I, I believe messages for the future. Uh, and I like to say, why would they give us messages for the future unless it was a, had a profound significance on how we handle ourselves at specific moments in the future? So this is something else we're going to talk about. 
because they provided some incredible information um, and, it's, and a lot of it points to this particular moment in time. So really exciting. So one of the basic principles, um, and again, in, in I see in the symbolism worldwide is that we are born into duality. And you know, we, we don't exist in a physical universe without polarity. And this defines so much about who we are. And so I like to say that, you know, the ancient Egyptians really strive for an alchemical understanding of universal wisdom. I know that sounds crazy, but it, it's really, it's really the, the message that I get from everything that we look at. Um, and so what we see, and, and the image here is showing you the masculine, the feminine, uh, the feminine uh, figure standing on the moon, and we have the sun. It's the sun and the moon. It's the day and night cycle. Uh, there's a perpetual dance between union and separation. Uh, you know, creation is separation. And then we inhale back into unity again. So it's unity consciousness, separation consciousness. Um, there's a, a dance between science and spirituality. But as Alan said, when you can combine the two, wow, you, you have a much deeper, fuller understanding of who and what we are because they are connected. Why would we separate something that's essentially mirroring each other? You know, one explains the other um, in both cases. You know, heart and mind, the two hemispheres of the brain. Um, you know, the, the, the left hemisphere is supposedly the masculine, well, not supposedly, it's said to be the masculine uh, analytical side of the brain. And then we have the feminine, uh, which is the right side. And of course, we always say we're left brained here. <laughs> and that's not a compliment because we're, we're stubbornly forgetting our intuitive side, our creative side. But what if we could somehow harness the forces of both hemispheres of the brain? And I believe this is something they, they really um, strive to attain. And you know, a lot of the rituals were all about doing this, is, is somehow harnessing the power of the heart and mind, science and spirituality, and the two hemispheres of the brain. Um, and I love this quote by Albert Einstein, I didn't arrive at my understanding of the fundamental laws of the universe through my rational mind. So yes. it's sort of like I yes. said about <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, Jasmine. I was just saying, I love that quote. That is such a good one. So true, so true. It is so true. We, we want to hide our intuition. We, we, you know, we've been told, you know, many of us as we were growing up that, you know, we can't rely on intuition and intuition is hokey or, you know, everybody talks about astrology, you know, when we were growing up. Now, probably most of us that are, you know, watching this now totally get <laughs> that we, we, we do have other senses and capabilities. Uh, but so many people don't, and we 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 tend to ignore our intuitive, our you know, our heart side. This is the suppression of the feminine in a way. You know, it's the feminine intuition. Why would we suppress half of who we are? Because essentially, we're all both masculine and feminine. Um, as Hakim used well, to say, when you do that, you're shutting down half of your brain, essentially. <laughs> exactly, and this is what's happened. So when we're in a, a patriarchal paradigm, we are forgetting that we are, you know, it's all about heart and love and intuition and creativity. Um, and when we're in a matriarchal, it's it's the opposite. And, you know, both are essential, you know? We, there's just aspects of both sides of ourselves that we really need to embody if we want to, you know, um, attain higher levels of awareness, you know, not that that's everybody's goal, but heck, I'd like to get there. <laughs> ah, so the mythologies, as I said, uh, oftentimes speaking about the stars and, um, I love David Matheson. Uh, some of you might be familiar with him. Uh, from He, he uh, started the Matheson Corollary, and he's doing so much more work today. I think he lives in California, at least on the West Coast. And he has really been able to interpret so many of the world's mythologies uh, as a reflection of what's happening in the sky. 
Um, and, you know, I could just say that and be done with it, but think about that. All of these mythologies can be spoken about in terms of constellations revolving above us. And why would they do that? Why would that be the case? And again, it's that interconnectedness. It's almost like the stars are a map for, you know, that we can trace for understanding our journey of consciousness in a way. And I will uh, illustrate this more as we move forward because you'll begin to see what I'm talking about when I lay out some of these patterns. And uh, it's pretty profound and significant. So, you know, it's not just by, you know, accident that they just sat there, you know, laid on their backs and looked at the stars. There's something profound about what's happening up there and how it describes what's happening down here. Or is it the opposite? Is consciousness driving what's happening out there? And I think it is the opposite personally. But again, we'll talk more about that. Um, but he, he said this, this is a quote from David Matheson. That the ancient mythologies and religious dogma are a metaphor for the patterns of the celestial spheres, the sun, moon, planets, and starry skies. This includes the Old and New Testaments, as well as the myths of the Sumerians, Egyptians, Greeks, Norse, Celts, Celts, Maya and Aztec and Inca, and many other peoples of the Americans, Hawaiians, Maori, uh, Polynesian Islanders, Australia, ancient India, China, and other parts of Asia. So like I said, it's all over the world. That's profound. So we did talk a little bit about Carmen Balter and Stephen Mailer, and here's a picture of Stephen and Hakeem. And uh, this is, I, as I said, I came the first time to Egypt on a tour with Stephen Mailer to meet Hakeem. Um, and yeah, I, I was blown away by gentleness of this man. Um, now Stephen's amazing, blown away by his passion, just incredible amount of passion for for everything ancient Egypt, but for what Hakim gave him. He was a student of, of Hakim's for, I think, well more than 20 years um, and just kept coming back for more. And uh, Hakim was just an incredibly gentle man who had so much to say, but waited until he was asked. Um, and that's just incredible. But if you want to know more about him, uh, as Jocelyn said, uh, the two books uh, written by Stephen with Hakim are The Land of Osiris and From Light into Darkness, uh, both, both incredible uh, books uh, with uh, a lot of the knowledge that Hakim shared with Stephen um, and others throughout the years here. And then Carmen Bolter, um, God bless her soul, she passed away earlier this year, uh, but she came to Egypt uh, at least 20 or 30 or 40 years. Uh, as she was, a, I believe, a teacher in Canada, but uh, she created this uh, really incredible series called The Pyramid Code that gives uh, everyone, again, a foundational knowledge of an alternative way to look at ancient Egypt as opposed to what we were taught in school. And she, she includes a lot of people at, uh, in, you know, a lot of different experts in the field like Robert Paul and, and many others. So, yeah. Um, so Hakim told us that uh, in ancient Chem or Kemet, there were originally 42 districts or gnomes of ancient Kemet and 42 tribes. And that 42 being an interesting number uh, that we might talk about. But he said, the borders of Egypt were nothing like what we see today. And again, the, the human condition, the human mind tends to uh, think in terms of boundaries. And so when we think of Egypt, we, ancient Egypt, we think of it in the same, you know, as the same borders, the same place that we, we see it in modern times. But in ancient times, Hakim said it was much, much larger. And, and again, ancient Egypt covers thousands of years but i'm we're going back to really ancient times which you know and again we can't say exactly how long you know 10,000 50,000 100,000 we don't know for sure but hakim was adamant that it was it, it covered a much wider area deep down into africa um and all over um 
all over the, the, the countries around the Mediterranean into India, and he said as far ranging as China. Um, and, and we have evidence too that the ancients worldwide were constantly traveling, navigating the oceans. Um, and we have evidence uh, that we'll talk about at some point where you know the Egyptians at one time you know went to Australia, probably South America, but they they were navigating the world at different times, um, and we tend to think they all stuck in one place. But again, we you know we get caught in these mindsets, and we we need to sometimes break free of them, just break open the box, and and think bigger. Um, so we see the influence of ancient Kemet everywhere. Now, I, I found this article about something called the Toba event, um, and it basically says that 69 to 77,000 years ago, a massive volcanic eruption occurred in Sumatra, Indonesia, beside Lake Toba. And this event was responsible for a massive loss of life, including most modern humans. So again, that's about, you know, between 70 and 80,000 years ago. Uh, human population in Africa may have been reduced to about 10,000 survivors from whom all current humanity is descended. Um, and this is something Hakim used to talk about, that everything came out of Egypt um, as these 42 original tribes. Uh, said, Many people migrated out of Africa within a few thousand years of the Toba event. Studies suggest that these people began interbreeding with Neanderthals, which we have evidence of today, the Den Denisovans. And uh, oh, by 60 to 50,000, 50 to 60,000 years ago, and both hominin groups appear to have vanished about by about 40,000 years ago. Um, so it's amazing we're still finding Neanderthal DNA in um, in people today. So there's still evidence. We and we don't know. We think we know, and a, a lot of this research is literally just you know theories and supposition. So why do we call it chematology? Um, and Stephen and Hakim developed this term, chematology, uh, to describe the, their, you know, the, our way, basically theirs, that has become my way, basically, of presenting the information of what ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet was. Um, and uh, people ask, why not Egyptology? And, I do have a great respect for Egyptology, and I do study all of the, you know, as many materials as I have time for, as I can, uh, because, you know, all, all research is so important. And today, no, I don't think any one person has all the answers. You know, I don't have all the answers. I'm going to offer a lot of ideas and, you know, not, you know, not a whole lot of facts because I like to jump out of the box. But the reason we say chematology is because Egyptology doesn't address a lot of what we see and experience. Um, and we, we can see that there's a difference. Uh, and Hakim used to say that Egyptology was a Greco-Roman mythology, uh, which meaning that a lot of what we know of Egypt was told to us by the Greeks. And the Greeks didn't get the whole picture. They didn't get everything. Um, the, the, the stories and legends have it that, you know, that the Greeks philosophers would come to Egypt and go to the priests, you know, and, and ask, you know, tell me everything. And the Egyptian priests kind of smile, half smile and <laughs> laugh and say, you know, well, go to India and learn discipline and maybe we'll teach you something. Um, you know, and, and so they would and they would come back and the priests would work with them. But, you know, I, I highly doubt they were told everything. Um, and, of course, there's stories about the priests even saying that, you know, the Greeks were like children in what they thought they knew about ancient history. Um, and that comes out in the stories about Atlantis and the so many, you know, the different cycles of catastrophism and so many other things that we're going to talk about throughout the series, like did the sun once rise in the West or did it? rise in the West several times back and forth. So things we want to talk about. We also get a great deal of our history from Herodotus, who uh, basically lived from 484 to 425 BC. So basically about 500 BC, he, you know, he comes to Egypt and he gives us our history. Um, and 
I think hopefully everybody here would know that obviously he didn't get everything. He didn't get the whole truth because even today we have no clue what happened, you know, <laughs> thousands of years ago. And, you know, that's only 2000 years ago. Well, Egyptian history goes back so much further than 500 BC. So um, I think he, he has a lot of interesting stories that we'll talk about, um, but uh, you know, he, Herodotus has been criticized for his inclusion of the legends and of legends and fanciful accounts in his work. Um, and the fellow historian Thucydides accused him of making up stories for entertainment. And again, we don't even know what's true and what's not today. However, Herodotus explained that he reported what he saw, was <laughs> what was told to him. And as I said, we don't know that he was told the truth. Um, and also what we find in Egyptology in the early days when they were dating uh, the sites, they were dating everything according to the earliest writings found at the sites. Uh, and we find this to be a bit irresponsible because you know you can find you know they would even find if they found nothing else a piece of pottery that had a date on it and they date the entire site to the pottery and of course you know it, it, you can simply explain why this doesn't work because pottery was used at the pilgrimages to come and bring offerings to the sites that could be thousands of years more ancient um, so and dating or relating anything to writings. Um, is I think, like I said, incredibly irresponsible because we go back to a time when they didn't need oral and written language because they, again, were more heart-based, more centered uh, and connected that they didn't, uh, as Hakim said, require language to communicate. They felt each other. So again, more con many, many more concepts we'll talk about, but, um, if you're looking at everything in terms of you know analytical facts and information i don't think you're going to get the root to the true root of an ancient culture if our perception of reality has changed that much from that time period okay. um, and we have to open our minds to something you know much more profound so egypt the term egypt uh, comes from Hegiptos, which was a Greek transliteration of the ancient term Hekka Pata. That's an image of Pata up in the upper right with the blue cap. Um, and he was uh, he was a creator a creator netter, meaning he he basically the, the blue cap stands for the primordial waters of creation. And he is the projection from out of the blue into form. He's the process of becoming form. Um, het means the place. Ka is the life force. And Pata was this creator netter. netter. So Het Ka Pata actually meant the place of the projection of the principle of Pata, of coming into form. Um, and it was, and obviously this, by mis misreading it or mistranslating it, they get, you know, Hegyptos or Egypt comes out of this. Um, but the term was found that is it as an inscription on a stella near a modern Egyptian villa, village of Metrahina, which today is known as Memphis. And some of you might have been to Memphis, it's near Saqqara. Um, and uh, Memphis in, in the ancient language was called Mennefer, and it meant the harmony of the land. Uh, so it was basically pointing out a place which was the capital at that time. Memphis was the capital of, uh, of Egypt, Upper Egypt. Um, so dynastic Egypt. So it wasn't the whole country or civilization. Um, and unfortunately, uh, not the name of the ancient land. Now, the, the land probably had many different names over time. But Hakim did find where Egypt was named, uh, the land of Egypt was named, and it was named with the consonants KMT. So the, the KMT we pronounce as Kemet, so you can write it in many different ways. It doesn't have to be spelled K-A-G-M-I-T or you know K-E-M-E-T. It can be spelled in many different ways, but it's Kemet. It's it's those are the the, the basic tones or sounds. So we do get the word chematology from Kemet, um, and 
uh, in the slide that we're showing now, you can actually see the inscription that says Kemet. You see the owl um, and you see the place is the X. X marks the spot and uh, <laughs> there's a reason for that too. Uh, the, the X is showing a crossing of two currents and this was very important. Mm -hmm. But um, so it's the place, you know, of, of the black land. So um, a lot of people want to say it's the black people, but it's actually marking the place, as you can see, uh, with the X. And it's saying the land was called Kemet. Um, and I like to take it. Well, first of all, the reason it they called it the black land, uh, Kem, is uh, they would say, you know, that Hakim told us was to uh, uh, show their reverence for the process of the Nile, the annual floods that dump this rich, dark, black alluvial soil on the riverbanks as uh, it flooded every year. And that rich, dark soil brought um, uh, paramagnetic minerals out of Ethiopia that were responsible for the incredible agriculture, for enhancing, you know, the soil and um, the agriculture and to bring the land of Kemet and the people this incredible abundance. And so they named their, their land, you know, Kemet to, uh, to symbolize her as a metaphor for this amazing gift that they got annually. But I like to take it even further than that because I believe it also refers to the moment we really fall into form, that we are the land, we are the people, this is the earth, this is an earth-based um, uh, consciousness. And therefore, I believe Kem can even refer to the entire earth, you know, and, and all its people. Um, and that's just the way I see it. It's coming, you know, into mm -hmm. form from out of the blue, basically. Um, in a three-dimensional perception of reality. And what's also fascinating is that, the, you know, Chem or Alchem, the place of Chem, Alchem, uh, is where we get our word alchemy um, and chemistry. So this was, Egypt was the uh, heart of, you know, the beginning of alchemy and the understanding of the elements and how you can combine them to create amazing, you know, and, and alchemy is so much more than just the elements. Um, it's, it's magnetism, it's so many different things, um, but it's also a conscious understanding and perception of reality. So we'll talk about that a lot as we go through the series. Patricia, I want to mention something there. It, it's so interesting to think about it, uh, that that term Kemet referring to us falling into form because then that naturally refers to our awareness, our consciousness of a time before we were in this form, right? Yep. It's marking exactly. that shift when we did come into form. So really fascinating to just consider all that that entails. <laughs> exactly. I'm glad you pointed that out um, because, yeah, that's a, a concept we're going to introduce that maybe we 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 do live you know we don't only live this consciousness that we do now where we're you know we believe we're physical bodies but maybe at one time we actually know that we're not um and we jump out of the illusion so yeah thanks for pointing that out it's 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 opening a door to a new way of looking at things but i think it's a door that needs to be open now for many different reasons um, we, the fact that we believe we are our bodies is keeping us locked. Um, and we're, we're basically, and I'll say this a lot, and I will repeat myself a lot throughout the series, but most of this bears repeating. We are held hostage by a belief we are our bodies, and therefore we can get caught up in agendas that create fear. Um, and that fear is the fear of the death of the physical body. And anything that threatens us can literally hold us hostage and it changes the flow of our lifetime. So yeah, let's jump out. Let's <laughs> let's remember that we're not just bodies. We're well, still remember alive. this this is a pattern that we learn as very young children. Like you say, the first when was the first time somebody told you that you were gonna die as a exactly. child? That was earth shattering, you know, that concept had never occurred to you before. Right, and also oh, yeah. how many times are we told as children, don't do that, you might get hurt. Don't do that, you might fall down. You know, all these ways that we're told, don't do that because it'll affect your body. 
And then we, we can't fly, you know, we're told we can't fly. Don't jump out of that tree because you might hurt yourself, right? There's just, there's so many levels to it. It builds this prison of perception around us that we can't mm -hmm. get past because our mind keeps us in this little box. Yeah. Well, exactly. So many people say, you know, that we're, when we're born, we're born with this great knowing within us. And as you guys both pointed out, that suddenly we're programmed first by our parents that tell us, no, you can, and no, yes, you can, you know, this, this kind of thing. Quite and, unknowingly, and then, they, they had the same thing done to them. So it's uh, oh, oh, no, I'm not saying it in a negative nobody's way. Nobody's fault. Everything in our environment is programming us. When we're told something's blue, or, you know, it, everything, <laughs> why everything exists the way it is. And uh, it's fascinating. You know, Hakeem used to say there's no, you know, everybody likes the idea of lineage of wisdom keepers. And he said that's not the truth of how that lineage works. Um, there is no lineage of wisdom keepers, meaning an oral tradition passed down. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but he said the true lineage of knowing comes from mother to child. And the mother during the first seven years of a child's existence literally gives the child the heritage of who he is. And if that mother is at, at the highest state of consciousness, then of course the child's gonna get the high knowing. But we devolve, as we've already talked about, consciousness devolves. And we're at a state today where of course it's nobody's fault, but we're getting a story that is basically not not, you know, it's telling us that we're limited beings. Um, we're, we have limited senses. Uh, and, and again, uh, not our fault, but in that devolving of consciousness, we've lost so many of our perceptions and our sensibilities. So we perceive the world through senses that are basically not telling us the truth of who we are. Um, and I'll talk about that later. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> How can we possibly navigate? And, and then we, we turn on our TV sets and choose a channel and we're programmed even more. Um, so yeah, these are, these are things we're gonna go more deeply in to why we think the way we do. Um, it's, it's really profound. And, and I really think we need to take the time to think about these things because it'll help us break free from the box. Um, and if, again, if that's your goal, um, I, I think it's a real important idea. If we could escape from all these ties that bind us, you know, they say the sky's the limit. I say there is no limit to what we're capable of. Um, so, yeah. So here we go again, as above, so below. We've said it a few times. Um, I like this imagery. I grabbed a, a photo of the Milky Way and put it over the Nile because the, the ancients truly believe that the Nile was the Milky Way on Earth, that everything we, we experience on Earth is mirrored in the heavens. And that is also um, the same reflection spoken of in ancient cultures all over the world. I can't tell you how many rivers I've seen throughout my travels where the, the locals say that the ancients said that the river was the Milky Way in the past. <laughs> Um, and, and that is because the expression, the breath, the breath of life, which the Nile was, the, the Nile was the breath of life for Egypt, that is the same pattern of everything all over, you know, cycles within cycles within cycles, and even the flow of a river, it is a cycle. As I said, the Nile flooded every year, and so many of these the rivers do, whether it's, you know, from... It's usually from rain or from, from melting snow or something, but there's this cycle of water and dryness. Oh, yeah, everything came into place as above, so below. And, you know, you, you, there, it's no mistake that the mythologies reflect this, but we, we, we kind of laugh and say, oh, well, so that, so this. But it, it's far deeper than that because the way it maps out is is – it's, it's unbelievably precise and correct, and it it reflects a much deeper pattern. And so we have to go. It's it's like you know, so Sirius rises with with the sun, and then the Nile floods. Woohoo! But it's so much more because it talks to even a bigger cycle, and right. it's reflecting that. So it is a fractal pattern that isn't just about one tiny river that floods. It's about you know bigger, bigger cycles 
of of our existence on the planet you know wow and maybe a bigger cycle of even the breath of life from the center of our galaxy and yes it is <laughs> so well and when you things. understand how to read the stars like they did and you understand the fractal patterns it becomes a giant clock in the sky and you can literally tell the time by looking at where we are in relation to the stars exactly you know matthew we, mark we, luke we, and john you have the four constellations and we'll get to that <laughs> yep. <laughs> We're going to talk about them too. So, yeah. There's so much material. It's so incredible. So much, so much to talk about. But uh, so, yes, yeah, this wonderful prophecy of Hermes trying to justice, I love it, where he says, Do you, do you not know, Asclepius, that Egypt is the image of the heavens? Our land is the temple of the world. Um, and it was uh, to the point. Where, as we said, with this flooding of the Nile and so much more that happened with the land of Chem, it reflecting all these different cycles that it, it, it makes you wonder if, you know, you know, who the architect of this world was, that everything is so precisely patterned. Um, there is a grand architect. And again, just food for thought, uh, because there, there is nothing that's left for chance here. Uh, and that's beyond amazing. Not that we don't have free choice, but there is in, there is an underlying pattern in everything. Um, yeah. We see it and in telescopes and we see it in microscopes. It's the exact yep. same fractal pattern. Yep, and it, it's without and within our bodies. You know, it, it's just it, it's just an existence, and it goes infinitely without and infinitely within. Yes. Which is you know again hard to consider uh and yet the, the patterns of the flow within our bodies is mirroring the flow of the stars in the heavens wow that's amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so i also found this um saying this this quote from the up 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 and shots. I'm not quite sure how to Upanishads. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, as it is the human body, so it is the cosmic body. As it is the human mind, so it is the cosmic mind. As it is the microcosm, so it is the macrocosm. As it is the atom, so it is the universe. Mm -hmm. And I put this in here to flip our perspective because you know, in the last quote, we're thinking everything is 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 driven by what's happening in the heavens. But what if it's all driven by what's happening within? Is it happening simultaneously or is it actually just is all of it together? Consciousness creating this pattern that reflects, you know, the, the duality of reflection of heaven and earth. Do we have yeah. conscious control over the universe? Well, they say we do. And I think, you know, as individuals, we have conscious, we are con consciously co-creating what's happening to us in any given moment. But as a mass consciousness, I think there is a huge power in how mass consciousness thinks and feels. And this is really important for where we're in the world today, where we're at, that if we would stop this energy of separation and uh, fear of each other and hold hands in unity. And it sounds hokey, but if we did, in a unified effort to make a better world, oh my God, what could we create? What magic would we create if we weren't driven to hate each other? Wow. I mean, think about that. It's or if that unity was just right now. For selling products or something, you know, because <laughs> it seems like whenever they gather the entire world together, it's to uh, sell Coca-Cola or to uh, <laughs> sell the Olympic games or to sell something else that's <laughs> corporate well, and monetary rather than actually just <laughs> raising the vibration of human consciousness to affect exactly. change on a universal scale. Well, exactly. And, and I think, a lot of that, you know, we say they're doing this to us and they're doing that, but is it really a them? Are these not just challenges we're facing that comes from something within us, mm -hmm. generated by, a, you know, a darkness within? And again, 
if we could just eliminate, and, they, and, and I will talk about this a lot as we go through the series, because ancient Egyptians were adamant, if we could harness our fear and anger, we would rise so quickly above all of this. Um, and again, there's such a huge power in that. And as Jocelyn said, this is a critical moment in time when we can flip everything that's happening just by changing the way we think, our attitudes, and uh, joining hands and remembering yeah, that we are. Absolutely, absolutely right. It's all frequency. Yeah. It is all frequency. We don't have to go out and protest. We don't have to do anything but shine our light and project the possibilities out into the ethers. And I think if enough of us did it, I think it would start to happen. You know, that hundredth monkey effect. <laughs> And more and more of us are doing it. More and more people all around the world are doing exactly You're that. You're right. I agree. 100%. People are waking up to it. Yep. Absolutely. They're far, far more powerful than we've been led to believe. Well, that's the basic knowing behind all of this. That yeah, And, and I, I love this, Hakeem, that we have a video of him saying this, but basically, you know, he would say, you know, you, he said it basically this way. You've got it. You know, you know you have it. You just have to remember you have it. And then he screams, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that is the idea. We're all asleep. We're in the dream world. And if we just woke up and remembered how powerful we were um, and how connected we all were, we wouldn't even want to hurt each other because it's like chopping off, you know, your own thumb when you hurt somebody else. It's We're all a body that works together unless we're working against each other and then we're out of mott in a state of disease and we feel pain. So, yeah. So, the indigenous worldwide tell us that the ancients had a much deeper connection to nature during a higher stage or age of conscious awareness and could feel, navigate, and harness the currents or forces of nature. The Neturu are what we would call gods and goddesses today to create sacred spaces that could sing in harmonic resonance with these subtle energies to enhance the physical, mental, and spiritual bodies. Wow. Think about that. These temples, when 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 they were, and, and they're still alive today. And, you know, all three of us who've been in them and experienced them can tell so many stories about how just being on these ancient sites can change your body, mind, and spirit. But can you imagine when, you know, the water was running underneath and, you know, the, the sites hadn't been quarried, that, you know, some of the basic minerals were still there and everything in place. These places were, you know, crackling with incredible energy and transforming us and keeping us in that higher state of awareness uh, through these highly energetic magnetic fields. Um, or I like to say zero point fields in some cases. These places were alive, living, breathing, you know, structures, uh, sites, networks. It's incredible. So that's a picture of Tipon, Peru. I've uh, been there twice with Brian Forrester, and uh, it's this amazing huge ancient structure where they use different stones the salt stone um, and this series of you know channels of running water that comes from out of the mountains in peru and they were utilizing it for agricultural technologies that's the uh, the basic theories uh, around what this site was all about um, and and the fountain you're actually looking at is really cool because you see the four channels coming of water coming down waterfall and then it goes into i think three channels or two channels and then you know so they're again an energetic formula to change the frequency of the water um and a bunch of us ran over with our water bottles and filled them up and just drank like crazy and the authorities are like no 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 <laughs> but, <laughs> I felt like I was in uh, um, Glastonbury at the at the tour where they have the the red um, 
the uh, water that comes out of the, the lioness at the uh, the chapel, the, the, the gardens there uh, with the iron water. And it, it just felt like this water that comes from the mountains, the pure, beautiful water, makes you feel so alive and, and energizes you. But anyway, um, so Hakim used to say it was always about sound, light, and running water. All of the sites, they utilize sound, light, you know, from the heavens, and running what the, the stars and the sun, uh, and running water, um, usually subterranean running water. So again, when we talk about the sites, we'll talk about that a lot. But this is a quote from Dereya Karim, a friend of mine, um, who uh, uh, with her, well, her father developed the science of biogeometry. Um, and uh, the, he's, he's written an incredible book and they teach classes and I will talk a lot more about to them uh, in, uh, in the series, but she, uh, this is quoted from an article that she wrote, since the dawn of humanity, specific locations on earth have gained significance as places of power. Um, these are really power places, uh, renowned for their spiritual importance. These are places of worship, burial, ritual, healing, and enlightenment. Digging in sacred sites around the world reveals remnants of earlier buildings, evidence that one monument was built over another, from a previous area. We see temples below temples below temples. Uh, and if even temple's the right word. Um, but again, temple, uh, I forget who said this, that I heard this from, but temple comes from the word tiempo, which is again, marking time, marking time and space. Um, but uh, she goes on to say, as time passed and regardless of changes in beliefs, civilizations still chose the same sacred locations for their rituals. These marked sacred sites were commonly located over underground streams that ran through rocky strata with revered water on which many rituals were practiced. So again, th this, this combination, this formula, um, the place where, you know, where, where I showed you was the X in the middle of the circle. And that X is two channels of running water crossing each other creates a portal. It's a portal energy. And you'll find this under many, if not most, of the sacred sites worldwide, because this is the, the energy that creates this, uh, this uh, incredible charge, supercharged atmosphere, where you have the ability to enhance body, mind, and spirit. Um, and as we're talking about time and space, uh, Toth and Toth, uh, we know Toth as the ibis bird god, or as we say, Neder, force of nature in Egypt. By the ancients, he was called Jehuti. Uh, he's on the far left, and he was responsible for written and oral language. And remember I said at one time we didn't need written and oral language, but when we fall into form or this belief that we are our bodies, we no longer are heart-centered. We become more focused on the mind conscious, you know, the, 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 the analytical side of ourselves. And so we no longer are able to feel each other and we need a language in order to communicate with each other. And this is what Toth actually represented. And uh, the two of them here, this is Sachet in the middle. She's one of my favorites. Um, and she was responsible for physical manifestation. Uh, she is sacred geometry and mathematics. She is she is the understanding of all the patterns of nature, all these fractal patterns that cycle and spiral uh, to create our perception of form. Um, and of course, the mirror, which is Hathor's mirror, which is the eye and the moon, the reflected light of the sun, is our perception as a reflection from within, um, which is we really, how we perceive the world um, is, is from the inside looking out, it's, it's reflected. We are creating it um, through our perception in, in many ways. But it was believed that Jehuti or Toth scribed the history of man's perception of time and space and Sachet placed it into the energy grids of the earth for us to experience through eternal cycles of conscious awareness. As astrologers, which Toth and Sachet were both considered to be, they traced the sacred geometry of the movements of the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens above that was being experienced on the mirror of Earth as below. So 
Again, we're going to talk about these netters a lot, but I want to give you, uh, you know, they, they're marking time and space right now. They're counting, you know, they're, they're going up and down on this palm, palm branch um, to, as they say, scribe what's happening in time and space. And here's another quote from Dorea. Um, and uh, she says, megalithic stones were some of the earliest documented methods used to mark these special sites, usually in high quartz content, huge megalithic menhirs, large man-made stone, standing stones were quarried and erected at the center of these sites to amplify and radiate the location's remarkable energy. Early settlements and later larger cities were planned and built to revolve around these sites. Sometimes these megalithic stones were even arranged in patterns to interact with different sky locations or positioned over the power spot in a gate shape known as a dolmen, a type of single chamber megalithic gate consisting of two vertical megaliths supporting a large flat horizontal capstone. With these structures, the opening of the gate always pointed east-west in relation to the cycle of the equinox. Now, what I just said has so many important things within it. Um, the first of all, when you're looking at these sites, chosen again for the, the energetics of the site, um, think about if everything changed in one fell swoop in our perception, like looking at the stars and how we perceive, you know, we perceive time by, you know, how our, our, you know, the disk of the sun, the moon, the stars, how they move across the heavens. We consider a day one 24-hour cycle of the sun. So if nothing was moving, um, we wouldn't have a perception of time and space. We'd have nothing, you know, to, to tell us, you know, about, you know, our days, how to count days, years, months, you know, whatever. Um, but let's say that whole imagery changed. And then we build these incredible sites to mark time and space again. Again, tempos, these are ancient temples to mark time and space through alignments to solar, lunar, and stellar events to give us, you know, again, our new perception of time and space. And I'm just putting that out there now because we're going to talk about this later. Um, that, you know, maybe at different times our whole view of the heavens change. And so we mark time and space in a whole new, entirely different way. Um, yeah, incredible to think about. So again, we talked about a time when there was a high technology, um, a higher implosive technology, when consciousness was at a higher stage of awareness. And when you look at some of these things, again, I just wanted to give you some imagery. We will go into depth about this later. Um, but take a look at the Sekhmet statue on the far left. And I know both Jocelyn and uh, Alan have been with me in front of Sekhmet many times. Um, and, you know, the, a lot of people that don't understand what I've been talking about will think, oh, my gosh, they're, they're praying to pagan gods. And it is so far from the truth. But when you look at this statue of Sekhmet, um, it, it, it's so many things are profound. First of all, Hakim said she's probably the, mo the most ancient statue still standing in the same place on Earth, um, which is, you know, she's at Karnak Temple uh, in a chapel um, to the left side uh, when you walk through this, this the central path of the temple. Very easy um, to miss. You need to know where it is. Uh, it's not. You have to know. Yeah, and and so many groups, Main Street groups, come and go and never get to to interact with this incredible statue. And when I say interact, I am intimating that she is alive. Um, she has human eyes. Uh, the the photo doesn't even do it justice, but you can almost see she's looking at you. Um, and when I say, you know, I, do I think the statue, the stone is, well, I do think stones and trees and inanimate things have consciousness. Um, but the way they crafted her image was so, in, in such a way that they were able to embody this archetype that is Sekhmet. Sekhmet, who she, she embodies the fierce rays of the sun, but so much more. Um, and, and, and in, she is one of the destructive gods like Kali, but in that destruction, she is healing. You know, she opens a space for the healing 
of, of mankind and the earth. And, you know, it's such a pivotal, important role. Um, but that energy of who she is, she's the great mother. She's, she's the great protector. She had the protected love of the mother, the healing love of the mother. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's just really the unconditional love of the mother. So when people stand in front of the statue, they are interacting with an archetypal, powerful energy. And that comes from the incredible capability of a people, a craftsman that, you know, had, <laughs> were able to literally, you know, feel the currencies and create and embody this. Um, and today, when we talk about, you know, artists, we always, I'm an artist, and we talk about when you're in the groove or you're in the flow, and you feel like you're channeling from somewhere else. Well, what if we could create that way all the time, that it wasn't just these brief moments of, oh, how did I do that? Um, and, and this is how I believe they were creating. They did these things because they could. And it was easy for them. This is sacred art. This is high science. This is not just a pretty statue. This had a function. Yes. Though so you can tell. Um, and and when people talk about their experiences with Sekhmet, I mean, I've had many. Uh, and there is a powerful energy there. And there is a guidance there. There is, you know, it, it's it's just incredible. And, you know, no, I'm not, you know, you know, people would say, oh, she's crazy. What's she talking about? Yeah, I'm not crazy. <laughs> You know, and I've always been really, I, I love science, and, but my mind is open. And when you embrace or, or come in contact with something this profound, and she's one of many things throughout the world that are, you know, that you find that are, it's just so profound, you can't deny the power underlying within it. Jocelyn, what, what was your experience with, with that? <laughs> yes, I was just trying to decide if I should share. I mean, since my first experience with this statue of Sekhmet, I was able, and she gave me instructions, and I was able to carry out these instructions, which were to do something I had not been able to do for the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years and had been trying to which was to move out of my old house, which was not a healthy, it was mold and different things and I needed to leave, but hadn't been able to. She gave me these instructions, all the forces of the universe clicked into place so that I was actually finally able to do that. And that has changed my life on so many other levels. So that's one little, one example from one person. I can only imagine the instructions and, and like, you know, impossible obstacles she's moved for other people as well. And the things we don't even realize that she gave us, because you know, if you're not awakened to what's happening, it's still happening. I just want to share that uh, a black cat just walked by right outside my window. I don't ever see cats just walking by here where I <laughs> where my <laughs> just walked right by. So she's with us. <laughs> and she is a black cat. She's, and she is. I mean, you couldn't. <laughs> Well, I got my cat Jasper sitting right here. He's a white cat, and he just turned around from sleeping and went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the life force, as you're saying, that they, you know, placed in this statue. The the life force. I just I feel it drawing from the heavens, drawing from the earth, right, drawing into this this form that we can come and connect with and relate to and, and really feel that. And, and yes, Alan, as you said, like that, this is all within us, but it's reminding us, it's helping us to access that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Incredible exactly. Ways. Definitely. No doubt. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and, and these two images at the bottom here uh, to the uh, right of segment, they're uh, from, uh, Chris Dunn's books on ancient Egypt and the technology, and he shows how they used formulas and mathematics and sacred geometry to create these living statues. Um, and again, the image in the top right hand corner, just look at the emotion, the energy, the, 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 the still knowing that, you know, comes out, emanates from that statue. I, I, I saw that statue in the British Museum. It's, it's uh, to me, it's just incredible. It, it, the flow of the line and the, the, the energy is just so powerful. 
uh, if you take the time to, again, interact with it. Um, and, and again, we talk about, you know, high technology devolution of capability. Um, and this statue uh, uh, you'll find, I found in the Nubian Museum uh, in Aswan. And it's a statue of um, the Pharaoh Khafre from the fourth dynasty. They say he's responsible for uh, the middle pyramid, um, which we'll discuss, but we say maybe not. <laughs> Um, but look at this statue and how finely, you know, crafted it is. It's absolutely beautiful. It's uh, it's like a nice, uh, some people say diorite nice, but Susan, my geologist, says no, there's no such thing. So it's nice. <laughs> um, but look at the, again, chicken scratch <laughs> that writes his name, Cafre. It, it, the same artist couldn't possibly have written the name that created or crafted the statue. So was the statue far more ancient? And then Khafre, or the priests of Khafre come along and say, hmm, <laughs> well, I'll take that as me. <laughs> and, you know, and write their names all over it. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we see this more often than not. And we actually have proof of it that so many so many of the different pharaohs, like Ramses II, I mean, that's well known here. He, and he we usurped say he everything. Runs, <laughs> well, they say he did it, but we have to remind people it was the priest. The priest had all the power. And the priest, it's the priesthood that wrote his name all over everything. But he did. And so they, they he, he basically, what, he, what they call it usurping, he usurped other people's statues. He'd scratch their name out and put his name on. Um, he even did that in his own father's temple at Abydos, Seti the first. Uh, Ramses the second was his son and came and just wrote in much bigger, deeper print uh, his his own name and his own scripts uh, right on top of his the, the beautiful craftsmanship from his father. So we know that this happens. And as I said, you can see the craftsmanship here. It's just, you know, you can't compare the two. Uh, can you go back one, uh, one slide to the one previous? Um, yeah. I just want to point out, look at the two faces at the bottom. These are statues from the Temple of Luxor, I think. Yes. The, the two sides of the face are perfectly symmetrical. Yeah, that's what he's actually pointing out here. Yeah, and no natural <laughs> human has this symmetry in their face. We all have faces you know sides of our faces that are slightly different one eye is a little lower or one ear is a little higher things like this the human eye looks at a face and the more symmetry we find the more we see beauty so there is that ancient memory of what you know of, of that knowing of what's really beautiful serene and at peace you know and on. speaking of high technology i mean it's how impossible is it for a artist even to just make that perfect symmetry on a statue well it is and i'm glad you pointed that out now i am an artist and and i you know i work in 3d i paint or draw and even in in, in i mean 2d rather <laughs> in two dimensions i can't draw in perfect symmetry you can't you, you just can't um without the use of a computer i think um, and yet here they are in three dimensions carving these statues, which is, is literally impossible. And I've even heard it said that if, if you were to use a computer hooked up to a machine, that the degradation of material would cause it to be off balance. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't even find that. So, yeah, um, I'm glad you pointed that out, Alan, because uh, it's it's just incredible impossible well, it's also isn't it the case if you have one little imperfection in the stone like a clump of minerals that's harder than the stone itself it's going to completely destroy the 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 symmetry of it i mean <laughs> it's it just blows my mind how they were able to to create something like this yeah and you know i also want to point out the dynastic gym you know egyptians uh, we're not chopped liver. They created amazing things too. Um, you know, the devolution occurs, but the dynastic Egyptians were capable of incredible feats, but you can tell the difference from the pre-dynastic, you know, we call it megalithic and even the fine craftsmanship. There is, there is that slight difference where they do 
what we would call almost, you know, supernatural work. You know, it's not natural for us to create that way. Um, it's, uh, it's just, yeah. Definitely. So, uh, Patricia and Alan, I need to sign off for today. So thank you so much. This has been amazing. And I'm sure you will carry on without me <laughs> here. Um, <laughs> can't wait for the next time. So thank oh, you. Oh, me too. And uh, yeah, we should talk soon, but we'll we'll discuss that later. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Jocelyn. Thanks for having us, Jocelyn. Thank you. So why don't we end with this slide and we can pick off again up again the next time because I think this sort of ends where we were at discussing. Yeah, because the next one we're going to dive into perception itself. Um so again, I brought this slide in. Uh, again, you can see Sekhmet. I mean, I, I'm just blown away by Sekhmet, can you tell? <laughs> um, but this this other um, statue, it's, it's a statue from Saqqara, and it's at the Louvre. It's called the Scribe, but it's 4,500 years old. And look at the eyes, how they use crystal and glass to give the effect of a human eye. Now, it's in our face here, so it does kind of look off a little bit. But if you're looking down at the statue in its position, it looks like human eyes. It's, mm -hmm. it's just really incredible. So, so do you agree we can wrap up now and start again next time? I think so. Okay. I didn't realize time is going so fast. I know. Two hours goes <laughs> <That's incredible. laughs> so fast. Well, thank you to everybody who's joined us. Um, Please uh, like, share, and subscribe, and we will see you very soon.